Thanks all for coming. My name's Memo, and I'm going to talk about intelligent machines that learn. What do they know? Do they know things? Uh, let's find out. There should be sound. Yeah. Uh, so before I talk about my current work, uh, using machine learning. I want to talk a little bit about where I come from to kind of give context to what I'm, what I'm doing now. I'm a computational artist, uh, and I have been for a couple of decades. And I usually I work with the visual domain, I work with dance, I work with sound, and I've been very interested in exploring new modes of expression. Uh, so getting away from traditional means of creating visual or sonic content and approaching generative systems. My interest has particularly been creating interactive systems that we can creatively explore and play like a musical instrument. The sensation that one gets when they play a piano and that real-time feedback loop of responding to what you're creating and going different places is what I've always been interested in. So over the years, I found myself designing more and more kind of semi-autonomous intelligence systems. Um, so this is all basically custom software. Uh, and I've been getting to this point where I started working with machine learning. And as I've been working with machine learning, I've also been interested in it not as a technology to augment our own um, creativity, which is what my goal always was, but also, I'm interested in the technology as a subject matter. Um, the social, cultural, and political implications, the philosophical implications of, of this technology. So I'll jump straight to it. We're here to talk about AI, because it's really hot. Um, it's very blue. This is what it looks like. And this is the trend of the term AI. If you look in Google News, it's been relatively flat for about 2015. And then over 2015, 2016, it's just absolutely exploded. And this is the term, this is a trend graph for the term big data, which is absolutely nothing until 2011. And then it starts rising over 2011, 2012, until it explodes in 2016. And it should come as no surprise that after years and years of, well, four or five years of big data, we have a really big explosion in AI. Because consciousness is evolution's solution to dealing with big data. I really like the metaphor that relates the emergence of AI as a response to big data to the emergence of intelligence in biology as a response to um, the increase in more complicated organisms and sensory motor systems, especially in the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago when vision evolved, um, we see this correlation in a huge richness in the evolutionary tree, as if these organisms now faced with this incredibly high dimensional data coming in, they need to find ways to adapt. The neural pathways don't have the bandwidth to accommodate for everything that's coming in. So decisions need to be made to decide which bits of input do we act on, which bits do we elevate to higher levels of cognition, and which bits do we um, discard. And many organisms, as they become more and more intelligent, need to start to learn how to model the environment in order to make optimal decisions and decide um, what to do. In fact, going even further, to be able to form any kind of social interaction, some organisms need to even model other organisms. So that when I look at all of you, I don't see you as you know, millions of particles in a quantum field, but I see you as thinking individuals motivated by certain goals and ambitions and emotions that I can relate to. So in a way, your higher level of cognition is an interface through which I can interact with you. So this relationship between big data and AI, or intelligence rather, I, um, I, I really like. But there's another reason why we're having a big explosion in AI. Of course, we have the computer power right now, that's true. But the real reason is because now the companies that are funding this, the purveyors of mass surveillance, the Facebooks, the Googles, 
this is what their business model relies on. They rely on making sense of big data. So the reality is they're investing billions and billions in this field. Of course, also GCHQ, the Five Eyes, they have more data than they know what to do with. So they require machines to go through all of this and produce executive summaries so that our puny little human minds can make sense of it. Um, I think it's safe to say that if World War I gave us analog computers and World War II gave us digital computers, the Cold War gave us internet, and the mass surveillance related to the war on terror and internet business models is giving us deep learning and AI. But another theme uh, which I really like about my interest in AI, I think this tweet summarizes it. Um, looking at all the work I've ever done, I can conclude my work is about two things, waves and God. Luckily, quantum mechanics unifies the two. And really, my interest here is the tensions between science and religion, or in a broader term, between science and technology and nature and ethics and tradition and ritual and these forces which pull us apart. So I'm really interested in the parallels between the rise of AI and mass surveillance, and looking at it through the lens of the ultimate panopticon, that is religion, the all-seeing eye of God. Because deities, our overseers, have always co-evolved um, to match the needs of the society and the modes of subsistence that our cultures have had. And I'm fascinated by this new evolved form of our overseer. Because it was these ancient religions that imposed these omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent powers watching over us, judging us, protecting us. And these were myths fabricated to control the masses. And now, as we're losing our spiritual sensibilities, we're drowning ourselves in a technological submission and materialism our overseer, too, is adapting and it's co-evolving. It's losing its metaphysical traits, and we're replacing them with digital uh, qualities. We've killed God, as Nietzsche says, but we're rebuilding him with technology to match our new techno culture. And the myth is becoming real. We have an authentic man-made deity living up in the cloud of all places, which just blows my mind. And this new deity is watching over us and listening to our dreams in ones and zeros. I also find it fascinating that the church used to be the purveyor of culture and art. And now we have Google taking that position as well as the new purveyor of art. We've had three separate um, or, you know, departments within Google make presentations today. So I find that a very fascinating connection as well. So in uh, 2014, I wrote a poem. It was a collaboration with Google. Not people working at Google, but the actual Google, the, the machine, the search engine. Because um, we have a very intimate connection with the cloud. We confess things to it that we don't tell our closest friends and family. We confide to it. We appeal to it. We ask for help from it. Um, I'm not going to show the whole video. Or I'm not going to read the whole poem, because I don't have time. But Google is the keeper of our collective consciousness. It sees everything we see, it knows everything we know, it feels everything we feel. And this poem is more actually a collection of prayers. This is what, in 2014, this is what people are Googling. This was our collective consciousness. So I want to move into my kind of more recent interests. And that is, I like using machine learning I'm going to avoid the term AI because it's too broad, and really what I'm interested in and what most of us use is machine learning, is use, looking at these algorithms as a way to reflect on how we make sense of the world, um, and how we see, and how we learn, and what it means to understand. And these algorithms are very flawed, but so are we. Um, and I like trying to find those, par those parallels. This is um, a deep neural network learning, it's, in this particular case, it's, I'm feeding it images from the Hubble telescope. Um, it had seen nothing before, and now 
It's seeing images and it's hallucinating, as uh, Kenrick was talking about. So what we're seeing is the evolution of this neural network's worldview. This is all that it knows. Um, I'm telling it to generate something random, and this is what it's coming up with. And this is the kind of underarching theme of my interest right now. So very quickly, a lot of people have spoken about what machine learning or what deep learning is. I'll also do my version, because it ties into how I think about it. The essence of it is machine learning learns a function f. So you have this function, y equals f of x. You give it x, it gives you y. Instead of programming what y is, you give it example data, and the machine figures out what f is. And when you have very complicated data, very high dimensional, like images or sound, it's difficult to learn f in one go, so you go really deep. You have lots of functions. You break the problem down into a hierarchy. You learn the whole thing in one go. Um, it's still one composite function, y equals f of f, y equals f of x, but it's um, a layer of lots and layers of these. And when you pipe data through this network, in this case from left to right, it is literally a journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time. Because each layer, each function, is a very high dimensional transformation. And it's a hierarchy of these representations. And Mario spoke about this, Kenrick's spoken about this. OK, so I've got five minutes left. That's a lot less than I thought I had. I'll, um, I'll skip through. So this was a project that I did actually at Google AMI um, last year. There's these language models that you project them into this semantic space, and it's able to connect words through meaning. And what I was interested in is how we interpret this, because there was a lot of um, press around learnt bias in these models. And there is a lot of bias in these models. But a lot of this press had incredible bias. A lot of academic research is determined to find bias to the extent where they report incorrect results that are biased. So I was very interested in this, like the parallel between the bias in the machine and the bias in the human. So I made a Twitter bot, I made a couple of Twitter bots actually, that randomly explores this space. It picks random words, randomly adds them together, and gives the results. And then when we look at these, we go, love minus sex is a door. Now, what does that mean? Does that actually mean anything? And it produces a canvas, in my mind, that we can then project meaning the same way that the machine originally did when it was going to the training data. I'm going to have to go really quick, because apparently I'm really behind on time. But um, this is another Twitter bot. This explores gender bias um, in these language models. It basically picks a random word and looks at the vector from man to that word and woman to that word, and then compares. Um, I want to quickly talk about a project that's not about AI, but I'm showing it here. It's a VR project. Um, it's about this notion of how do we make meaning and how do we understand the world. Um, these are some of the motivations behind it. The idea that what we perceive to be real is a reconstruction in our mind, and that perception is an active process, and that the actions that we take affects the meaning that we take. So I'm interested in these both at a perceptual level, but also at a higher level in terms of well, the social and political polarization that we see in our societies today, and how perhaps we're unable to see, to empathize with other sides. And I say that as somebody who sees himself as very much on the left, but I'm more appalled by the left's um, inability to understand why we are where we are than, than the right at this point. So this piece was actually a, a reaction to that. So you can go and experience it. I'm going to have to skip all of these, because I want to get to. Um, yeah, this is actually a one-hour presentation as well, so I'm kind of skipping through. So th I, I explore a phenomenon known as a binocular rivalry, where the two eyes see radically different images. And when that happens, the conscious visual experience is a kind of weird mishmash of the two, a bit like the image here on the right. And what your conscious mind sees 
is uh, it's unique to you, uh, on your physiology. I have no idea what you will see. And this will move. And um, the image you start seeing, it, the image appears to be here, whereas I see all of you now out here as an external object, whereas in reality, you are here. This picture is here. And when you're presented with arrival images, the image jumps from being outside to inside the head. And that was something that I really wanted to explore. And the dominant image flickers between the left and the right. Um, so these are some of the things that you'll see. It's radically different images on either side. I want to come back to hallucinations. A lot of research in machine learning on the academic side, they try to create these really clean data sets so that, like, take faces and crop all the faces perfectly so that they can generate photoreal faces. I really like dirty data sets. In this case, the data set's really dirty. This is um, Trump, Le Pen, Nigel Farage, Theresa May, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Um, and you put all these things in a model, and you give it a good stir, and it spits out all this stuff. But the most interesting thing is, these are points in a latent space that you can manipulate. So if I want to go to the area where this is, uh, I think you can recognize this. And so my interest is not creating autonomous creative machines. My interest is in creating collaborative creative machines that allow me an interface to control. The same way I like, a pia I like to play the piano. I don't want a piano that plays itself. What good is that to me? Um, I enjoy the act of creation, and I just want to explore different spaces to create in. Another data set I've worked with a lot is I'm not affiliated with Google Arts and Culture, that lab. I don't have access to their database, so I scraped everything I could find online. Um, and this is the public database that they have. Um, it's all Creative Commons. and. This goes on for about 20 minutes. So I've been training models on this, like a, an archive of human culture, and doing lots of experiments on how I can use this. So this is an experiment where this is real time. I'm drawing on the left. The machine is producing the image on the right. And when I posted this on Twitter, it was amazing to see some of the comments. Someone commented, but the machine has never seen light. And someone else commented saying, but it's seen thousands of human interpretation of light which I thought was quite poetic. These are some unconstrained hallucinations, as in you tell the machine to generate, and it just generates these images. Again, I have a lot of control over this. Um, so this is an installation I just, I just got back from Kazakhstan, where this is happening. It's a three-screen installation where one screen is training on the audience. So this is a very slow process. It's um, got lots of surveillance cameras around, and it's just training in real time and reconstructing. The image on the middle, I'll demo if I have the time, it's trying to generate what it's seeing through the eyes of what it knows, in this case, which is this huge archive of art. Um, and I really like that metaphor of you see what you are, and that's my VR piece is about that as well. The meaning that you take depends on what you've seen before. Especially, I find that fascinating when people look at these hallucinations and they see, oh, I see Dali, I see Braccage, I see Francis Bacon. Um, someone came into my studio and said, I see a lot of religious imagery. And I think, well, that's you. You see the religious imagery because that's what you've seen. Um, and I find that completing the loop really fascinating. Um, do I have time for a few demos? No, I don't. OK, well, I was going to show you how this all works, but. Um, Oh, just one minute. OK. Um. Let's see. Oops. I should have loaded it before, actually. So actually, everything is one giant application at this point. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Let's see. So what you're seeing right now is a machine that hasn't been trained that's opening its eyes for the first time. This is an untrained neural network that's training right now on my face. Um, so if I say relatively still, it will start to understand what it's seeing. Um, but if I move over here, it, it, it doesn't know what this is, because there's nothing that's told this machine that this thing can be here or here. Um, so if I show you guys, it, it's never seen you guys before. It's trying to understand what it's seeing. And in this context, to understand, what does that mean? It, in my mind, it means to be able to most optimally compress and predict. So if it can do it while well, it's here, but if I move it over here when it can't, it hasn't optimally understood this environment. Um, I want to switch to a trained, so this needs to go on for quite a bit, but I can switch to, um, if I turn training off, So this is, for example, a pre-trained model. I'll show you what the camera is seeing as well. So now, right now, what it's doing is, on the right is the raw input from the camera. On the left is, this has been trained on only artworks, and it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing. So this isn't style transfer, because in style transfer, it's just more like um, a filter on the image. Here, it's just reconstructing from scratch, trying to make sense of what it's seeing through the lens of what it knows. And I just want to show one last model relating to this. But before I do that, I need to start this. OK. So this has only ever been trained on images from the Hubble telescope. And it's trying to generate what it's seeing through the lens, again, of what it knows. And the interesting thing here for me is the level of control that I have. Because I can make, tell it to make the picture dark, but it's not making the image dark. It's generating it in a dark way. So right now, it's generating all the view lots through these tiny little galaxies. And if I start making it brighter, it will start introducing nebulas and things like that. So now it's a lot brighter. That's maybe not as good. But yeah, that's the gist of it. Just remember, we are all made of stardust. And uh, yeah, sorry for going over.